<laughs> Thanks everybody for joining. My name is Matt Kellogg and I help head up sales and business development here at Media Creek. And as a former radio music director and as, you know, associate program director, I have a lot of love and respect for my colleagues that are on this panel today. Uh, they have each played an integral part in uh, helping radio stations distribute their content digitally. Today, we're gonna to be talking about distribution in a couple of different ways, specifically revenue, how distribution tools can help create new revenue streams for radio stations, but just as important, if not more important in today's uh, status where we're at right now is, is getting vital information out, getting, making sure uh, content is getting to where you need it to get to. So before we jump into the questions, we'll love an opportunity uh, to get an introduction from everybody. We'll start with Jackie, move to Fred and Jason. So if you all can just tell us a little bit about what you do, your company, and, and maybe how you got into this space so everybody gets to know you a little bit. Sure. Um, my name is Jackie Parks and I've been in uh, the radio space for about 20 years. Uh, I have two companies. Uh, one is called Envision Wise. Um, under Envision Wise, we build websites. Um, we have a lot of uh, ad additional tools that we've created for radio stations, such as Text Me Man, Event Delay. Um, we have a gift certificates portal, which I'm, I'm going to bring up here in a bit. Um, yeah, we, we've been uh, really passionate about what we do and we've listened to what radio stations need and we've just continued to evolve over the years. Um, a lot of people know us as Linked Up Radio. It's one of our platforms that is very popular uh, with the radio stations. Um, the other company I have uh, started a few year, years ago, it's called Pivot Radio and we tapped into building Alexa skills for radio stations and building apps for radio stations and We've kind of partnered with a couple other companies on ideas as well. So yeah, that's what we're, we're doing over here. So hi there, I'm Fred Jacobs. Uh, I also have two companies, Jackie. So I'll talk about both of them. Uh, I'm headquartered here in Detroit. Jacobs Media has been around for 36 years. I've worked in broadcast radio pretty much my entire life, uh, or at least career. Uh, Jacobs Media is a consultancy and audience research firm for commercial, public, and uh, Christian music radio stations. And then my other company is Jake Apps, which is a mobile app development company, primarily for radio. We've done 1,300 apps on both the iOS and Android platforms uh, since uh, we uh, opened for business about 100 days after Apple opened the app store. So I'm coming at it from both angles, the uh, the digital side, the streaming side, and the broadcast side. Hello, uh, I'm Jason Stoddard, VP of Broadcasting Media Creek, uh, mostly focused on Live 365. Um, also at previous incarnation of Live 365, I directed the broadcast product there um, and started there back in 2000, which was really kind of my first introduction to both internet radio and radio. So. Uh, 20 years of uh, internet radio and obviously coming from it a little different angle from the other folks here as far as you know we're the ones that are really kind of looking for the distribution and uh, you know there's a lot of different obviously I've gone through um, a lot of different types of distribution on that and um, happy to be here with everybody thank you awesome thank you glad you're all here with us as well well let's jump right into it Jackie I want to uh, get a question to you first uh, looking at distribution, and I'm going to call them tools for the better part of this conversation. What distribution tools right now are hot in terms of helping generate revenue for you and your clients? Sure. Um, well, our websites in general, we have really worked hard uh, to help uh, radio stations make sure they're utilizing all their tools with those websites, um, particularly ads throughout the website and how to uh, manage that and place that properly so they get the most exposure. Um, our, our hottest thing right now is our gift certificates add-on. Um, it's really uh, useful for local businesses and restaurants. Uh, we can set the gift certificates portal up in, in less than 24 hours for a station. Um, it gives them the opportunity um, if they're losing clients and they're not able to um, get that actual cash flow from their clients, they can you know, request uh, exchange of coupons or gift cards and then turn around and sell that on this other website. 
um, so that they're still getting that revenue. So it's, it's really popular. We set up several in just the past weeks uh, for stations and it's really helping them maintain some revenue at this time. Um, we also have a, the Text Me Man Club that I mentioned. Uh, not only is it useful to communicate with the listeners and the audience, or their audience uh, while everybody's at home, but we've, we've seen some um, radio stations use it internally just to communicate with their staff because they're not coming into the office. So that's been a popular tool with us right now. Uh, we've been helping stations set up listing pages through our CMS, uh, business directories, anything that can help you know, get information out there to the public and, and utilize our system. We've got it pretty easy to use and that's been our focus these last couple weeks. Fred, how about you? Anything uh, that you're seeing right now that folks are digging into and using more often than not? Well, I, let's talk about the 800 pound gorilla in the room and that is COVID-19. I, I thought it was interesting when Jackie brought up uh, all of a sudden there's an interest in restaurant uh, gift certificates, and that's because all these restaurants are closing up and radio stations from a traditional revenue standpoint have just been under intense pressure. So it, it's really an interesting point in time now for radio where I would say the average company uh, revenue wise is generating probably upwards of 80%, if not more from traditional over the air spot sales and all of a sudden people are at home and they're listening to streams on apps and smart speakers and, and uh, laptops and, and desktops and, and all of a sudden that digital future that everybody's been telling them, you know, get going here. You, 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 you got to make sure that you've got great distribution and great monetization. It's coming in a torrent. So this is a crazy point in time, but I think, one that we, we've kind of been waiting for. It just, we weren't expecting a global pandemic to maybe turbocharge the whole thing. So we're at a really crazy point in time right now. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And I, I think yeah, to keep the vein of the COVID-19 conversation going throughout this conversation, I think it's gonna make sense because it is salient with the tools that we're using and why we're using them, but certainly uh, invite you all to kind of expound upon that and, and, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, Fred, can you share how you use data? You mentioned Jacobs Media, how you use that data to determine, say, Jacobs and, and the direction that you go with your distribution outlets there. So about 16 years ago, we started doing national tech surveys uh, in North America, um, where we aggregate radio stations from around the continent, tap into their email databases, and that gives us an avenue into their core listeners. And so we've been tracking uh, technology usage. Uh, and, and the beauty is this started in 2004, 2005, which was essentially the beginning of the iPhone, the debut of YouTube, Facebook uh, uh, becoming available to, to everybody. So we've been tracking what people are, what radio listeners are doing when they're not listening to the radio. And from there, we are helping guide stations better understand how their audience interfaces with technology because they're all different. If you are programming an alternative station with a younger audience, they tend to be more technically forward, um, acquiring everything. If you're dealing with a classic rock station or a country audience, a more mature audience, it has taken them a little bit longer. And so what, we're, what we do is we work with stations to help guide them so they can better understand what their audiences are doing because there are so many different distribution outlets, it is difficult to cover them all. And so we're, we're trying to help them prioritize their digital distribution strategies. That makes sense? No, absolutely. That makes really good sense. Uh, Jason, same question for you. Uh, data that you've seen in the past with Live 365 and even currently right now, you know, how does that help you determine, you know, the you, tools that you're going to put out there, you know, what's important to get in front of the broadcasters to make sure that their message is getting to where they want it to be? Yeah, and I think, I think um, you know, with distribution, it can be kind of a, a little bit of a, um, there's good and bad about it. You know, I think a lot of times you're testing out different distribution areas and hoping that they stick, hoping that something is gonna, you know, which one are we gonna be able to monetize versus 
maybe I think that this one is one I need to take a chance on because it might become ubiquitous. Um, you know, it's two things that are ubiquitous now as far as it goes are um, obviously mobile apps were one of the really good bets. <laughs> um, even before that, websites, uh, you know, those two things are uh, probably the only ones that have really kind of been these ubiquitous at this point, maybe smart speakers are coming up now. Um, and obviously if you consider, you know, obviously the desktop and those types of things, but you know, there's, we've gone through a ton of different types of distribution. I mean, TiVo, Palm and Blackberry. I mean, there's so many, you know, dead end routes that you've kind of gone where you've tested it out. And I think in today's environment, what would be the best is to kind of really rally around what's really generating the revenue for you. And what are your, also what are your listeners responding to the best? And sometimes those are the same, sometimes those are different. But I think the idea is to really make sure that you know, you're monetizing it properly, right? And maybe you're taking a little less risks and spending a little less time developing for kind of more niche distribution size. And you're gonna just really make sure that you're monetizing your core audience and sticking with that. I think that's kind of an important thing, at least in the short term. Jackie, on the heels of that, talking about websites and mobile apps and even smart speakers, obviously there's this idea of generating revenue radio commercial radio in general obviously is is they make their money on advertising and you know outside of the over the air spot obviously websites and other distribution factors banner ads or even streaming ads you're able to monetize that um what are some of the clients uh from you that you're seeing where are they coming for you is it is it monetization first is it platform first and how do you um, from a company, you know, running a company perspective, how do you kind of leverage or, or balance, I should say, the the cost of adding on, say, a new website or an Alexa skill uh, to the amount of revenue that can be generated from that? Well, we, we have been working with clients kind of case by case on what they need. Um, I have gotten a lot of inquiries about the Alexa speakers because now, now all of a sudden they, even though they were aware about it, aware of it now they want to make sure that they're pre have that presence in the Amazon skill store. Um, I'm finding I'm spending a, uh, some time educating stations the difference between Amazon and the app stores. They think it's the same thing, but it, it truly is two different things. You know, there's the Amazon store where the Alexa skills live and you've got your apps where Android and iOS is and um, some stations just aren't familiar with that in itself. We, we work with a lot of small and medium sized markets and they haven't really given this much attention until now because now these speakers, uh, all of a sudden everybody's in their home and they're listening to the radio station through the Alexa speakers so uh, or other smart devices. So um, I do have a lot of traction in that right now and we're helping people um, you know, work out payment plans just to get going. You know, we've been flexible on website setup fees, gift certificates, anything that they need. If there's a way that we can help uh, a station get out there, um, get noticed, you know, through this difficult time, we, we've been helping them with that. Yeah. You know, you know, Jackie, the, do you mind if I ask her a question, man? Is that sure. cool? That's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. See, one of the things that we've picked up on is that even for stations that have good mobile apps, um, good skills, all that, there is often a disconnect in terms of the audience being aware that these outlets exist. And right. many of them are really underpromoted, right? And I, I think those are the chickens that are coming home to roost right now. I mean, here people are at home, they don't have a radio, they do have an Amazon Alexa, and yet they may not even know that they can listen to their favorite radio station on these devices. So I think marketing these distribution outlets is important. But the other thing, and I, I'd love to get your take on this, Jason, you too, is radio operators know that you can't monetize a radio station unless you build a good product, a good format, you hire personalities, you have a good technical presence, all those things. I mean, radio people know this. And yet sometimes when it comes to some of these new distribution outlets, they will not really invest heavily in mobile or they really won't put very much into uh, skills. And then they wonder why monetization is so challenging. And I think you, you have to build the experience first before you can turn around and go, hey, how do we start making money here? And right. it, so it, has that been your experience as well? 
Yeah, I, I think um, for us, we try to keep it simple for them because they have so much on their plate already. Um, we, we explain to them, like with us, everything we've done from our website CMS to the Alexa skills, we created a dashboard so you know, they can easily go in and just change out those pre-rolls or outros. Um, we just try to make it simple. In, in, with our apps, they have a dashboard, they can change things out. But definitely, um, there seems to be a lot of educating going on, <laughs> at least on my end. I mean, I agree. Uh, more so than ever, which is okay. You know, again, we're here to help people and that's kind of been our specialty all along is take the time to talk it through with them. Just like you said, Fred, with your, with your team, you're talking through with each station and what they need and what's important. And, and yeah. we, f we feel the same thing. Fred, you mentioned uh, building the experience. I, I really like that a lot. And I think that might be uh, worth taking a few minutes to get everybody's perspective on that. And we'll start with you, Fred. You know, what is the experience that you focus on building and how do you see that working compared to other things that you've seen not work in the past? Well, I, I think there is a tendency, you know, Jackie said it really well, there are these bright, shiny objects out there, first mobile apps and then uh, smart speakers. And I think there is this tendency on the part of broadcasters to just want to jump into those without strategically thinking about, wait a minute, what are we building here? How do we want the audience to interface with us on these devices? Are we building an app that primarily is going to stream or are we going to have our videos in there or our podcasts or our jock presence, all those kinds of things. And so those are some of the questions that, that I think broadcasters need to ask themselves or we need to ask them. And Jackie, I, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you have those moments where somebody says, I want skill, but they really don't know what that entails or how right. it might really interface with their brand. So a, a lot of it is more strategic, I think, Matt, than, than maybe some people think who are just trying to check off a box and say, well, now we have a skill or now we have an app. So thinking about how the audience is gonna use you on these distribution outlets and what's the most important to them. So that's why I fall back on research a lot because to me, it's like radar, you know, I mean, we're all, we all work with smart programmers who know their audiences, but it, it really helps to have data and research um, in order to better understand what the outcome is gonna be and what the experience should be like. Jason, can you talk a little bit about the Live 365 experience and maybe some of the uh, maybe some of the things that have not worked in the past that have gotten <laughs> to the platform that we see today when you go to the website? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, obviously there's plenty over 20 years that hasn't worked, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and and then a lot that has. But I I kind of wanted to you know to to Fred's point, the idea of um, letting the data and research help drive you, and then you know, kind of be, being strategic about it. It isn't just like, hey, I'm, I'm a station, so I need an Alexa skill now. You know, making sure that you've got everything lined up that way, um, you know, to make sure that your presence is just as it is in, in your, on your app and on your website is really there on your Alexa skill as well. And then, you know, I think you mentioned it as well earlier, letting people know that that's even there, you know, that there's that, hey, just because you built it doesn't necessarily mean they will come. You got to let them know about it as well. Um, yeah. And then, you know, over the year, going back to your original question, over the years, as far as things that we had done, I mentioned things like TiVo, you know, I mean, that was back when TiVo didn't even have, a, you know, there was no wireless. You had to plug it into your phone line and it updated itself, <laughs> you know, at one in the morning or something like that. And it required a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of things like that. And, you know, you kind of finish it up and you go, oh, well, how are we generating revenue here? Oh, whoops, you know, we, we, we don't have the way to do, we can't do display here, we can't do, um, you know, all the audio ads can't be there, it's gotta be more family friendly. So there's a lot of these ins and outs that no matter even how good your APIs are and all of that, it's, it's you know, each distribution area is some place that requires some portion of your time, some technical skill, um, and it's going to take resources, you know, and so if you don't really think about that investment, you know, it's an investment. It's not something you like, oh, I built my Roku skill or my Roku app and now I get to forget about it. You know, it's not something like that. So, you know, next thing you know, you could have 10 different, you're distributing on 10 different platforms. And then all of a sudden, 
you know, you push out something new and you really are like, oh, wow, how do I update all 10 of these <laughs> to have a similar experience across my website and then monetize in the same way and things start getting stale because you haven't updated them. And you see that even happening on Samsung smart TVs. If you look at the apps, you know, they came with smart apps. And some people jumped on that and they developed their smart apps for Samsung. And now you go pull up your smart app thing on your Samsung. There's like seven of them in there and no one's worked on them for years. And, you know, and I, so I think you just got to be real, you know, you have to be real strategic and careful about it. I think, you know, Fred's, Fred's completely right is, is you can't just jump in there and start checking boxes or go, Hey, that's really cool. Or, and, and other things people fall into are, Oh, I use that a lot. So I got to develop for that, you know, and it's like, well, you're the one guy. <laughs> that's using it and, and so it is important to be really strategic about it and to not bite off more than you can chew you know and and remember that you've got you know most of your folks are really probably on mobile and web and now like, like smart speakers as well but there's like a few that you're really going to focus on and unless you have those really dialed in um, you're going to start spreading your resources then if you if you you know bite too many off and just try and do everything so just to kind of put a button on this part of the conversation and to kind of keep moving things forward, one of the things that I hear is that obviously there needs to be a strategy when it comes to building the experience. And that strategy needs to be determined, obviously, by the management of the radio station, looking at what you have and what you need and making a decision just like everything else. Um, I had one question. And anybody that might be able to answer this, Jackie, I'll, uh, if, if you have some insight to this, um, for those that are listening and maybe that are looking to invest more in distribution technology, what bucket does that go in? Is that like a, a if I'm if I'm a radio station you know owner like a small small market radio station owner is this going towards my marketing budget? Is this a technology buy bucket that you know my engineers in charge of? But how, do you have any insights to that? Boy, that's a t that's a tough question. Uh, you know, I it seems like with the radio stations, they all wear so many hats, you know, the staff members. And I, you know, I deal from, you know, the intern all the way to the engineer at a station it's, I, I, or the owner talking to a variety of people. Um, they all have different skill levels. Uh, it's another reason why we try to keep things simple. Um, I kind of want to add to uh, a few minutes ago, I think one thing I find myself reminding stations often is you know, your website is very important. It, it is the hub to everything else. It's an information source. It's the news source for local news. You know, you can tell people how to enable that Alexa skill through your website, you know, through a little link. Um, you can promote the next thing that you have, the new app that you just purchased. Uh, it's, a, it's a hub. It's open 24 hours, you know, seven days a week. Uh, you need to drive traffic to your website, which is the hub for all the other resources that you have. Um, you need to make sure that your website's connecting to social media. I think that's important. Um, I also remind stations that they have a voice, the biggest voice out of any other industry. And they can get on the air and say, you know, download our Alexa skill, download our app, visit our website. Don't forget that they have that voice, even in the most critical time, you know, such as now, um, they need to use their voice, you know, on air. So that's... Um, as far as what bucket it falls into, gosh, uh, I, I think it's kind of which way you look at it. Um, I would, I guess, maybe in the marketing department, uh, all distribution is so important. But um, I, I think my point is, is use your website, you know, as your, uh, like your foundation and everything else from there, you know, can blossom. Thank you. Fred, you mentioned that you work a lot with churches, and I was doing some uh, research a few months ago, and what I found was uh, next to country music formats, the Christian radio format, there are more Christian radio formats in the United States than, than any others next to country. Um, so obviously there's, there's a lot of Christian radio out there, a lot of which is nonprofit. They rely on donations. They're not necessarily advertising traditionally like a commercial on-air AM FM station. What tools are working for nonprofit organizations such as Christian Radio? Yeah. Well, we also work for public radio as yes. well. So it, it's interesting, a completely different audience, but the basic business model is the same. You know, the public radio stations are still using pledge drives as archaic 
as they are, they, they still technically work and they bring in money. Um, the Christian stations, I think, are a little bit more spread out in terms of uh, varying distribution elements, but they're moving more to website and apps uh, as a place where you can donate in much the same way you might to your favorite charity. And something that Jackie talked about just a moment ago is important. I mean, yes, the website is key. It is the hub. But she referred to the talent. And I think whether you're talking about a Christian station, a public station, or a commercial station, radio has this megaphone, their announcers, their personalities, and you can really move people to whatever result that you're looking for, whether it's donate, download our app, activate that skill, that kind of thing. So sometimes stations don't make as much great use of their megaphone as they could in order to communicate a message. Are there any tools that uh, you see that are coming out that are helping with, like, say, you know, you, you mentioned pledge drives being a, a bit archaic, and I, I can't help but think of the PBS pledge drives where they're answering the phone back there. Yes. I've always wondered if they're actually answering the phone. I think they are. Um, they are. are. Are there tools now on the digital kind of t distribution side with apps or skills that are that you're seeing that are working where folks can say, hey, make sure Alexa's off. Hey, Alexa, go make $5 <laughs> to this station. Not yet, but I think the potential is there. Maybe more on the mobile app side. I mean, we're excited about the smart speaker opportunity, but some, it may have been Jason who said it before, smartphone uh, uh, acquisition is at 98%. Smart speaker, depending on whose research you're looking at, who the audience is, may be more like a third, 40%, that kind of thing. So if you really want to fish where the fish are, I mean, you want to be in as many places as you can. But if I had to put my eggs in a basket, it would be the website and mobile. And then if I've got the bandwidth, literally, and the money and the staff and everything else, I move to the smart speaker zone. But I, I, I think certainly radio has not made tremendously good use of the new technology especially in these non-com situations where they're relying on donations more than anything else. I mean, Jackie, Jason, has that been your experience as well? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do, I, I think you ranked it in a perfect order. You know, um, I think the smart speakers are still maybe at the end of the line. Um, people are, you know, they need that website, it, which, which is the foundation, in my opinion. Um, and then they're, they're focused on those apps because I think they have a longer existence. <laughs> and then the smart speakers are kind of falling in third. But um, a, a couple quick ideas I just thought I would share uh, with the websites alone. Um, you know, stations ask me all the time, how can I um, get more traffic? Uh, how can I you know, get this going more. I think one of the most important things is uh, content. Like a station needs to be pumping in local content. Uh, obituaries seem to be a hot thing. People want to, for some reason, see the list of people who died. <laughs> so they create forms on their site, you know, to list those features. Uh, photo contests, like there's a lot of things you can do to engage the public. And then in reality, the public becomes your advertiser. Uh, we have stations that do uh, the photo contest, and then, you know, if, if, for example, this is a great example, you know, let's say a station wants to run a cutest, cutest baby contest. If my best friend puts up a picture of her baby, next thing you know, she's texting everybody out there in the community to get to your website and vote. So that's another way to like engage. I mean, along with the news, which is the most important thing right now, but local content, you know, on those websites is a great way to engage your listeners. Jackie, you lead me to my next question, and I'd like to start with Jason on this one. We've talked about ways to get your content out there and distribute it, but technically, uh, Jason, what are some ways or what do you see happening that folks are doing to help make their stations become more discoverable? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, especially for, for us, you know, where we have thousands of stations, I think that that's always, you know, that's the thing is how do you make yourself how do you make yourself stand out when there's thousands of, of people trying to do something very similar? 
Um, I think part of it, again, it does, of course it goes back to the content, like Jackie was saying. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you don't have something unique, um, then, then, you know, you're, you're probably, you're, you know, you're, you're probably more of a hobbyist than, than something that's a real going to be a business, you know, or, or be able to drive that type of listenership because you're kind of doing a more boutique -y thing. Like I like top 40, so I'm going to start something top 40. I'm going to start an online station for, for myself. Um, but you know, what's your, what's your niche? What do you do? Well, I think is big. Um, you know, and I, I think again, relying on your website and, and some people it's flipped. Some people it's more their mobile app than their website, you know, mobile apps driving more of the traffic. So it's one or the other of those. And I think making that, um, a true destination for what you've carved out and you can kind of grow that too. You know, I started as, you know, I'm a jazz station and now I'm, and then I'm selling jazz vinyl and now I'm helping with venue, doing venue stuff and doing work. And you can kind of expand your, your sphere of influence, I think, based on what you do well. And I think it's going to, it's going to vary station by station. You know, it's really going to depend on what, what they do well and then focusing on that. So I think it's, it's a lot of focus really and, and, and hard work, of course. I'd love to get a, a pulse check and I'm going to age myself here. Uh, so when I was a music director in APD in uh, 2005 and 2006, we were begging for streaming. Like that was the one thing that we wanted. We had a website. Mobile hadn't even come out yet. The iPhone hadn't really come out, nor apps. And we just wanted streaming. And, and at that time, our general manager, I remember saying, cost too much. There's no way we're ever going to stream. It's just not worth it, right? Fast forward 15 years, everybody's streaming. For the most part, there are still some radio stations that aren't streaming yet. And for the most part, those radio stations have websites and even apps. What are, what are uh, programmers right now asking for? What, what are some of the things that you're finding is sort of like the next kind of need to have, I should say? Not, not like to have, but a need to have outside of the website and mobile app. Okay. <laughs> it, Jackie touched on it several minutes ago. Uh, it almost is not a matter of having more tools. It's, it's having enough people who can actually operate the toolkit to make it work. And, I, you know, I was a program director. You think you're dating yourself. The last time I programmed a radio station was in 1983. And the only thing I had to worry about was what came out the two speakers. That was it. I think about what a program director has on her plate right now wow. between what's on the website, what's on the app, what are we doing with smart speakers, what's our social media presence. I mean, it, it just, what are, what are we doing with the email database? I mean, there are so many different content and distribution concerns now that, that weren't even around 10, 15 years ago. And so part of the problem is, is that radio stations are staffed clearly worse than they've ever been before. There have been a lot of layoffs and, and staff reductions, as, as we know, sad but true. And so there's usually not enough people to be able to cover the content. And again, I mean, you look at the websites and you can see that most of them, you know, look like minor league ballparks as opposed to really cool places where you can come and uh, get snagged into the content. So most of these people don't have the time or the energy or the resources to create content on all these distribution outlets. So to, to me, it's more a matter of we don't need more tools. We actually need more people to run the tools. Would it be safe to say, and, and, I'll, and I'll let you answer this, Jackie, based on what Fred is saying, okay, um, and, I, and I'm just kind of like peeling it back a little bit. Would it be safe to say if you're a radio station, like, A, get a website, need a website, and then make it monetizable, okay? Okay, you have a website, you're monetizing it, all right? You're streaming, you're monetizing it. Let's get an app and monetize it, okay? Um, what, what then? Is it, is it a, I, I go to a smart speaker because it's sort of like the bright and shiny thing in the room. But Fred, you mentioned email list. Jackie, you, meant, you, uh, you mentioned, you know, text me and, uh, and other various OTT outlets Jason mentioned as well. What, what should radio stations, let's assume for a moment that they are monetizing successfully their mobile app and their website, what would be the next uh, mountain to climb, if you will? 
Well, um, let me think here. <laughs> um, I, I definitely think the streaming is important, you know, just as important as your website presence, because again, the voice, especially at a time like this, you know, they need to have streaming, period. Um, one of the things I find with our customers is they need affordable streaming. They need streaming that's not going to cut out on them. You know, they need secure streaming. Like uh, your stream will not work on Alexa or the apps unless it's a secure stream link. And there are some providers out there that, um, unfortunately, on, on the streaming side, um, I, don't, I don't know um, on top of my head, but those links need to be secure for all of that to work. Like it's important um, with the with the websites, they need to be secure. Like everything needs to be up to par. And so we kind of, you know, walk through those steps with the station as well. Um, but I, I think streaming is, is just as important as everything else is what I'm trying to say. And I do agree with you, Matt, that, um, you know, it is the next hot thing right now, the smart speakers. Um, it is something that people buy for gifts. You know, it was the hot, one of the hottest selling Christmas items over, you know, this last holiday. Um, having your, pre hardly anybody has an old school radio in their home, you know, uh, but they do, they all have a smart speaker. You know, it's being built in the thermostats, it's being built in your cars, it's, it's in watches. <laughs> so having your station accessible through that means is, is very important in my opinion. Jason, did Live 365 provides distribution with website and through mobile app, uh, I'd like to say it's it's also secure and uh, <laughs> and affordable as well, uh, yes. Jackie. Uh, so with those box marks checked, you know what are some of the stations, Jason, uh, asking you as far as you know what what are some of their pain points or things that they're looking to do beyond having those initial check boxes uh, marked? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, obviously outside of distribution, there's also features and things like that for our platform that I think are, are, are the really the things that we know we need to keep innovating on and building for, for our big set of broadcasters. Um, on the distribution side, obviously smart speakers. I mean, I think it's kind of a no brainer, who, from, you know, as far as what's the next kind of physical medium or, or way of, of consuming it. Uh, I think you'll probably see, I, you know, and I, I I'm still don't even know if I'm like this big believer. It's like, what is a smart speaker anyway? Because that's a speaker that can, that basically takes one of these voice assistants or these AI type of, and I guess they're not really AI, but the voice assistants, right, are running these, right? So it's whether those voice assistants are on a speaker or like, you know, like you're saying on your thermostat, on a refrigerator, um, obviously, you know, that's kind of, I think, it's the internet of things is what they used to call it. I don't know if they even call it still, but it's basically everything's going to be connected. Everything's going to have a speaker in it. You know, you're getting your speakers in your toilets There's speakers in, you know, I don't, you know, your refrigerator. I mean, having a speaker on your refrigerator is, um, so I think that, you know, the idea is that there's right now, there's a handful of companies that are the ones that are running these, you know, that are, that have that kind of back end that you're building these on and, you know, you're betting on them. I think that it's pretty safe to say that Apple, Google, and Amazon are going to be around for quite some time. And so I, I don't think it's a bad investment to start working that direction. And I think that those, you know, those, those are the companies that you, that you know are going to be around. You know, there's not a lot of risk there. But I, I think we still, it is still early enough in the smart speaker business that we don't really know where it's going to end up. You know, I think we're just kind of, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of the wild west. And I think it's still, you know, it's still probably difficult to, to monetize it, how you monetize everything else. So, you know, but uh, that is the direction everything's going for sure. Awesome. We have some great questions I know that are coming in. So I want to save some time to answer as many of those as we can. With that, I just have one more question. I kind of want to bring it back around and, and Fred, uh, you touched on it early. Uh, but I kind of want to focus on this time that we're in now with, with the COVID-19 and, and the shelter in place for many of the states and folks having to work from home, uh, losing those, you know, those commuting minutes that you get on the radio station. Um, I would just generally like, like each of you um, as thought leaders in, in your uh, perspective industries, just your opinion on what, what you're seeing right now, you know, how this is affecting, how it can be improved, maybe even you know, some, I'm, I'm a bright and shiny, you know, light at the other, the end of the tunnel kind of guy. So if, if, if you're seeing any of that, I love it if we could share and Fred, we'll go ahead and start with you. What, what are you seeing right now? 
Well, Jackie touched on this a few moments ago. I mean, now that so many people are at home and they're not in their typical radio listening environment of the car or at work, um, I would take exception to the number that she threw out about how many people have working radios at home. That's more than people think, but some of these radios are on the nightstand in the bedroom or in the garage, not accessible to people in the media room. So the stream, she's exactly right, is critically important right now that people are out of their comfort zone. So um, you, you can't say enough about the importance of the stream. The other thing though that, that I would add is the importance of the email database, which is a very overlooked um, communication tool with the audience, but that's really what we use almost primarily to do research about what the audience is doing at any given moment in time. We just did a flash COVID-19 survey among commercial public and Christian music radio listeners. And in three days, we netted about 40,000 in-tab responses. And it was just so informative to give us an idea of what the audience's mood and mindset are right now. It's, it's less about smart speakers and it's more about fear and it's more about that roller coaster that people are going through now, being up and down, and how radio stations can build that companionship um, and, and help elevate mood. So to me, it's actually less about hardware and software and more about how are we talking to people? What, what are, what's important to them now, as opposed to you know, what's the hot new toy? That's not what they're thinking about at this moment in time. Jackie? Um, I agree with everything Fred just said. I mean, that, that's spot on, really. Um, I also think uh, during this time, you know, we offer a lot of services here with Envision Wise and Pivot Radio, but we don't offer everything. And I think it's important to lean on, you know, other companies and, you know, refer each other business when needed. Like, you know, you guys there at Empire Streaming and Live 365. I mean, you're definitely on my list, you know, when I share resources with stations. I I have a lot of people that come to me for everything under the sun and, you know, having great connections with other businesses and having those resources available to them. It makes it easier for that station to make decisions because it's, it's kind of an all in one, one stop shop. And, you know, I do like to provide that type of thing to our clients. Um, I think, you know, you said, uh, you know, what things can be improved on. I think that was part of the question there. Um, I think it is an important time for stations to engage in that local content, you know, to get out to the community and provide that information because that's, that's why they're listening. That's why they're going to the website. That's why they're opening the app. They want to see the latest news in the community. So, you know, really focusing on that is important right now. Jason. Yeah, what was the question? No. <laughs> you know, and, and we're a little bit different because we're, you know, we're a platform. We're not necessarily managing the content of the station. So um, I think, Jackie, that's a great point as far as the businesses themselves in our industry, which, you know, none of us are, are the huge, the huge business, you know, we're not the Spotify's and the Pandora's or even, you know, these guys. But I think for us kind of banding together and leaning on each other and, you know, which, which helps our clients in yeah. return. I think it, it, that's an interesting aspect that I, I think a lot of people kind of overlook. Um, you know, for, for Live 365 in general, I think the idea is for us to make sure that we're there for our broadcasters and we're not just, you know, we're not just a vendor that someone's cutting a check to or whatever, you know, that we can actually um, help them if they're having, if they're being impacted, how can we help them? obviously improving the service and making sure that the service is rock solid and all of that is something that, you know, only helps them as well. So I, I think just what we've tried to do is open up channels of communication. Um, you know, Fred's talking about email, which is, yeah, a lot of people don't think about that, but it is huge. Um, you know, open up those channels of communication so that they can actually talk to us and say, hey, here's what's affecting me. And then it's like, well, how can we help you? You know, obviously we can't make we can't snap our fingers and make things go away or do things on this big macro level with that. But, you know, maybe at the, at this kind of broadcaster client level, there are things we can do to help them. And I think that's kind of one of the things that we've made efforts for. Yeah. 
Before we get into the uh, folks that are joining uh, questions, I just uh, ask your permission or if you would like to air it out now, a website that folks can go to or an email and then we'll go ahead, Philip, have them put that in there. So if you want to go ahead and you know give us a website or an email where folks can reach you uh, if they have any questions or are interested in any of your products and then we'll go ahead and copy that and put that in the chat. Don't all speak at once. Uh, go ahead, Jason. Oh, well, yeah, mine's pretty simple. You're seeing my name on there. If you want to, I mean, write me directly. I'm always, I'm always available. Jay Stoddard at live365.com. Uh, obviously our, our support team, uh, support at live365.com is available as well. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got a, a big team available, ready to answer any questions. Jackie, uh, you can, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jackie. Um, I'm very involved with our companies. Uh, people can email me at Jackie at EnvisionWise.com. It's spelled with an E, E-N-Vision-W-I-S-E.com. And our website is EnvisionWise.com. It has a link over to uh, Linked Up Radio, uh, where a lot of our radio products are, and some of our other um, products are all on there as well. So yeah, feel free to contact me. Uh, so I'm uh, Fred at JacobsMedia.com. Jacobsmedia.com is the one website. Jacapps, J-A-C-A-P-P-S.com is the mobile app company. So you can check out what we do at either of those websites or just shoot me an email. Awesome. And I certainly encourage those that are attending right now, if you're interested in any mobile applications, smart speakers, websites, distribution, please reach out to these folks. Uh, they are truly the best in the business and I'm honored to be with them Thank today. You. Uh, Philip, let's go ahead and get into some questions. Awesome. Can you see them or you'd like me to pass you a couple of them? Uh, why don't you, could you just read them out one at a time? Absolutely. We'll, we'll absolutely. Yep, for sure. For sure. Um, here's an interesting one. Is there any platform that small webcasters and podcasters can discover each other to help monetize their distribution? So I think this is going for like communities, uh, communities of, of small webcasters casters and, and podcasters to engage with each other. I mean, you know, obviously Live365 has, we've got a, a radio group going. Um, that's really great. You don't have to be a Live365 broadcaster to be a member of it. We've got our uh, the specific broadcast Facebook page too. And there's a lot of sharing information there. I'm sure there's a lot of resources and, and, and social media groups. That's probably one of the better places to look um, for that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Does anyone else have any feedback on that one? I've got about seven other questions, but I wanna you know, keep it at a good pace here. So here's an interesting one. How do you find the right balance of monetization without sacrificing the user experience? Uh, what decisions have you or your clients had to make related to this? Fred, you got something to say about that? <laughs> yeah, well, and slightly. I mean, I touched on this um, earlier. I, I think if you put the monetization card um, before the content and experience horse, you're, you're going to be sorely disappointed that whatever investment you have made in a mobile app or a smart speaker skill or any of those things, it's not going to work out. I mean, the, the content has to be there. The experience has to be there. I think one of the outgrowths of, of the last 10, 15 years of technology is that people are becoming more discriminating when things don't work, right? You know, you think about opening up an app and it fails. Are you gonna go back and try it again? No, you're gone, you delete the thing. And so I think it's critically important that the experience is there, that people go, they understand what the app or the skill is about, they see the way it works and it obviously has some kind of meaningful application to their lives. So to me, it really does start, start out with content and the experience and then once you get that right you build an audience up then you start worrying about monetization and sometimes uh, everybody is very eager to monetize first and worry about content and experience later remember i'm a programming guy i agree with fred <laughs> content is very important so um kind of a different uh, direction here, but how would a small webcaster go about attracting sponsors to uh, uh, more to the radio, uh, excuse me, I kind of misread that one, but um, you know, would you promote uh, reach instead of an established audience? 
um, you know, kind of a question about how you would attract sponsors to the radio stations when you're just starting out? I think doing, you know, if you're trying to attract sponsors, having something engaging with the listeners, you know, like a contest, like I was talking about earlier, maybe like a photo contest, then you can have a sponsorship, you know, for a movie theater or, you know, something <clears throat> related to that. Uh, or if you're, you know, focusing on the obituaries, you can have a sponsor for the florist. Uh, it just depends on what you're looking at there, but um, engaging the audience in something like photo contest or, or the newsletters, uh, you know, you can communicate with all of your subscribers, you know, put advertisements in there um, and, and at the same time, keep them updated with the local news. So back to the content, <laughs> the number one thing, having good right. content, you know, the, everything else kind of rides off of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know on the support team at Life of 65, we get lots of questions about sponsorship. Folks are very interested. They want to do it. They want to reach out to their community, their neighborhood, their city, whoever it is, the small businesses near them. And so we do hear that, that topic come up for sure on our, on our end of things. Yeah, and I think it's important. That's the important part too is like a lot of people think sponsorship and they go, oh, you know what? Nike would really love my, my <laughs> section, you know? <laughs> Um, and, and it's like, you know, start, start local, start with the, the, the places, you know, and I think that's usually going to be, you know, that's, that's the way to, that sounds really big, but that, that is something that sometimes people get this pie in the sky type thing. And, uh, you know, it's never, it's not going to happen until you're, uh, you know, unless you're really lucky at this point, I think. I would say, uh, find a fan, you know, you find the fan that's going to be willing to support you. I've, I've, I've found success uh, in, in many aspects of my life around that. And if you find a fan of your radio station, um, you know, they're going to be more apt to support than somebody that's never heard of your station at all. Um, and then the first part there is, is getting the station name out there. And that, that's for webcasters and small stations alike. It, you should be introducing yourself and your station in the same sentence everywhere you go. Um, so get, getting the name of the radio station out there, I think is important, and, you know, and yeah, you know, false humility aside, you know, this is something that you've made. This is proud of. I, I still talk about the radio station I used to work at, <laughs> like I still do. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think one additional point to all of that is that you, I think the whole idea of finding a fan is, is spot on. And so you run a sponsorship, it actually works for that client. What radio stations sometimes fail to do is build on that success, then use that as a story that you can tell other sponsors and other potential advertisers, look how this worked. And sometimes radio doesn't do a great job archiving and telling its own success stories. So when you get one, one begets the other, if you do it right. Yeah, right. I think uh, that is about all the time we have right now. Uh, I know we weren't able to answer all the questions. Uh, I will get with the panelists with the questions and we will answer as many as we can and answer those offline. Uh, but in the last moment I have left, Fred, Jason, Jackie, thank you so much for your time today. I think, you. Uh, you know, the one word that keeps ringing in my ear all day and we've even talked about this, you know, especially during this COVID-19 is, is hope. Um, you know, you being here brings us hope. You know, there's, there's folks that spend lots of money to go to places to, to hear great minds like such as yourself. So to, to be able for you to offer this and your insights uh, it just as a part of your day for, for no cost to everybody that's joining, that gives me a lot of hope. So thank you for that. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank it was you. an honor to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Great. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Nice Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Nice to Thanks see you. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now. Greatly appreciate everyone attending World Audio Day today.